Hello, and welcome to the Permobile Academy webinar series. My name is Stefan Morin, and I'll be the moderator for today's session, Considerations for Alternative Drive Control Selection and New Permobile Solutions. Now, I'd like to introduce Sarah Lusto. Hey, Sarah, the webinar is all yours now. Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you to joining our webinar for considerations for alternative drive control selection, as well as a discussion of some new permobile solutions. I'm Sarah Lesto. I'm one of the clinical education managers for Permobile. I'm based out of Denver, but I cover from South Dakota down to West Texas. I'd now like to introduce one of our panelists, Brooke McCall. Good afternoon. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, my name is Brooke McCall. I am from Portland, Oregon. I am a permobile user. Um, I have a spinal cord injury uh, going on 20 years at the C4 level. And professionally, I work for the United Spinal Association. I am senior director of our tech access initiative, and I'm um, excited to be here. Awesome. Thanks, Brooke and Sarah. My name is Angela Regeer, and I am currently the Senior Portfolio Marketing Manager for our Power Products at Promobile. Um, a little bit about my background. I am an occupational therapist by background, practiced 10 years in neuro rehabilitation. A big chunk of that time I focused on wheelchair seating and mobility. Then I moved to the industry side of things about five years ago as a clinical education manager and most recently in marketing. So um, we're really excited today to share Brooke's perspectives with you, Sarah's clinical perspectives, and then go over some new updates that we have on the product side of things. As we're going to start with uh, just a conversation between Brooke and I about her lived experience when it comes to power wheelchair mobility, mobility in general, um, and certainly in context of today's conversation related to drive control. So Brooke, thank you again for being here with us. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so I think we'll just jump right into it. Um, when it comes to your power wheelchair evaluations, as you just mentioned in your introduction, you've been using a wheelchair for about 20 years. Um, so you've probably done a few wheelchair evaluations over that time period. Um, during that evaluation process for you, how much influence did you have? Did you want when it came to making the decisions? And has that changed over the years for you? What's that looked like? Yeah, it's definitely evolved, but I can't say that I, um, I've always wanted it to be a collaboration. So even in those early days, and I was lucky that I was at uh, my first wheelchair evaluation evaluation and, and trials were done um, during rehab and I was at Craig so I was able to have um, I felt pretty confident in what we were doing that said I wasn't really pleased with any of the options presented um, as a new quad I was frustrated um, I around the hospital was using a sip and puff and especially early on. I was just a poor sip and puff driver. I didn't have any idea how I would really be able to navigate the world since I could barely navigate the hospital. So there's some scratches on the sides of some corners that I, um, you know, may still be there, at least under some paint or something. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> I'm not the only one, but uh, yeah, it was, um, I was a little frustrated. So um, given that that was where we started things right there at the, at the spin puff. I said, well, what are my other options? And um, so I saw some head arrays um, and chin drives. And while I've changed a lot in the 20 years, but really um, have evolved more recently into being accepting about anything around my face. So I am using this large tool here, but, um, because it's efficient and I, I work hard, I have to be faster, but I've done a lot over the years to avoid having things around my face. So I really didn't like the straw. I lost it all the time, talk a lot, constantly losing my straw. Um, 
And so I actually saw somebody rolling around the hall. Somebody was coming in for their own um, reasons to Craig and they had a peach tree head headrest, uh, excuse me, head array. And I said, oh my goodness, I saw this guy. He has this thing, it's flat and small. And they kind of laughed and said, oh, we know what that is. It's a peach tree. And, um, and they went along with, you know, they said, hey, you wanna explore this? All right, let's do this. And um, so use that originally and, you know, they got me hooked up and yeah, so no one made that decision for me initially and, and that probably uh, helped inform the fact that I've always made my evaluations pretty collaborative. I mean, of course, want others' expertise, but um, I want to have say not only just on the drive system, but how that relates to my life and um, and also, of course, my seating system and really even the base I have, I want to make sure it works for all the environments I'm going to be, um, be in. It's not just about the hospital or in my home. I'm out and about and doing things. So um, I want to be heavily involved and I want to know the options. That's great. It's great to hear that you had an experience early on where you were actively involved and it kind of it sounds like that's who you are, right? Like you're going to drive what you want in life and what works for you. And it was nice that that initial experience kind of supported that piece and really gave you that strong foundation for knowing that that's possible um, when you're selecting equipment. Right? Yeah, yeah, it was, um, it was good. <laughs> yeah, so in terms of, you mentioned you, you don't tend to like things around your face. So for you, it sounds like specifically to drive controls, like that could be one of an important consideration, or at least historically for you, has been trying to, to the aesthetics of it and, and being able to, you mentioned talking, you like to talk. And so having something in your mouth might be a little, little challenging. What other things kind of have been goals or priorities for you? I think as clinicians, as, um, as equipment providers, I, you know, sometimes, like, of course, our initial focus when we start to think about drive controls goes to driving. Um, but of course, there are many other considerations and, and things that we need to look at when we're evaluating. So what are some of the most important things to you when it comes to how you operate your chair or a drive control? So I'm over the years, um, and as I've, I've aged, I think early on, I was kind of like a no fear type person. But the reality is safety is super important to me. And I've had a lot of uh, scary situations, one being I don't use a peach tree anymore. Um, my original chair was actually recalled um, because my it was unsafe. It used to malfunction, which is probably why more of us don't have. I still love the tech. I love the option um, of the peach tree system, but it unfortunately wasn't reliably safe for me. So I had to abandon that. Um, so given that my chair used to take off full full speed ahead till it hit something uh, a number of times, I'm not as comfortable as as some people. Um, a lot of, I have a, tons of friends in chairs and they all like to, uh, generally there are a lot of men on in that realm and they all like to go fast and more power, more speed. And I'm kind of, let's keep this safe and sound. So especially with my alternative, um, drive systems, people using joysticks, it's a whole other ball game. I think uh, it's more intuitive, but um, I often don't feel uh, hugely in control. Um, I've had some neck weakness. I recently had a syrinx removal surgery, so um, my neck is weaker. I have bigger spasms, so I have to consider that in my, um, my drive um, decision. Uh, I have a ASL head array. Um, and I don't use it right now because I have really big back spasms. So when I'm out or I'm first um, starting to drive, sometimes when I move my head, I'll have a big bridging spasm. My head goes back and stays. If I'm on, you know, I've just gone over a curb, that means I'm going forward whether or not a car's coming. And I don't want that. Um, so I'm, you know, I've had to, I, I, I likely will not use that drive system again um, because my spasms were not repaired during the surgery and it just doesn't feel safe to me. Um, I like the option of a chin control, which I have trialed, but um, same thing, I'm a little concerned about the spasms. I'll, I'll be consulting um, my team a bit more with that. But for me, it may, 
my main only, um, that SpinPuff is my only option at this point, and so uh, I may have to fully adopt that. But yeah, so um, comfort is huge, aesthetics matter. Um, uh, we, Angela and I spoke a little bit um, earlier in the week, and, and I was frustrated during my last chair purchase because my ATP didn't ask me about if I wanted the starburst wheels versus the reflective and had my chair with reflective for a while and, and said, hey, why didn't you, you know, can I have those, the starburst ones? I, I want those. And he said, oh, well, I never ask anybody. It's a pull down. I just don't do it. And I said, well, okay, D you know, give everybody that option, uh, please. And especially me, I very much do care. Um, so we got that figured out, but um, yeah, just to really encourage people to give everyone every option they have. Uh, there are only so many decisions we get to make on these uh, chairs and, um, you know, making sure people know what's available um, to them and to get that if they need it. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think sometimes, I mean, I know when I was in the clinic and certainly you know, you get in kind of a habit and routine, and um, especially if you're limited on time, we know that how our system is currently set up to evaluate and prescribe CRT, you know, complex rehab equipment. Oftentimes, it's it's tricky. It's a quick process, and they're but they're very important decisions. And so, it's a good reminder that you bring up Brooke to um, make sure that you're offering those, even if nine times out of, nine times out of ten, someone says, "I don't really care about those details." Like the one person that it does matter to, like that's why we we need to make sure we're asking and kind of slowing down and making sure you're extremely actively involved in the process. So that's a great great reminder, even for me, even though I'm not in clinic anymore, but I know I, I am guilty of that at some point. So. Um, in terms of evaluation, because you mentioned you're kind of in the process with your more recent change in function, looking at what solution is really going to be best for you. Are there certain things during the evaluation process that have been like really meaningful or effective for you, whether it be like education about the different options or trialing, like what's been helpful for you during that process? Yeah, I definitely, so knowing um, here I'm, I'm in Portland and knowing here uh, when I go in for a wheelchair seating or any kind of evaluation, we don't generally have many options or um, someone will bring in kind of what's suggested. This is what we're figuring we're going to go with. And maybe if I ask, they'll, they'll bring another back um, or a, a cushion. Um, it hasn't been uh, my bigger experience, but also working with my permobile rep and saying, okay, like, let's get some, can I try some stuff? And together we've made that happen. But I, what I really appreciate it is when I'm back at Craig and I know that they can show me, here's a, your six, here are your six backrests, here are your eight cushions, uh, let's, let's pop you in some of these, let's try it out, um, feel it out. Um, how about you take this for the afternoon and come back and let me see how you feel. Take this cushion overnight. Uh, although all of that matters, you know, there's there's issues with cu cushions for me. I've had ones where I slowly slide out all day or others where um, I'm just not as comfortable. Uh, and it really matters to get to try those. So the last time I was at Craig, we changed my entire seating system, um, even though my other one wasn't very old because I had a ride custom and my body had changed a bit. and it wasn't working for me. So um, I wish I had more of those options everywhere I go, but I would like my um, my team locally to, to give me more options. Uh, I feel like often it's like, we're you're going to get this chair. And it, it takes me going out of my way to say, mm, let's think about this a little more. Let me try some more things. And yeah, I, I, you know, time is limited and, and um, Going back and forth is kind of a pain, but at the same time, I'm going to be sitting in this chair for five more years, and I want to want to sit in it, and I, I need it to make my life easier, not harder. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. So, obviously, trialing is key. Um, if you're going to have something for five years, that can be tricky, but um, certainly also educating on the options, right? What I'm hearing is sometimes options are presented, and there are reasons, right? Like, people have had a lot of experience and they may think, hey, this might work well for you, maybe. And also I'd like to learn about other options, um, I think is what I'm hearing you say. Like 
you know, I value your experience and also let's look at everything so I can really make sure it's going to fit exactly what my needs are day to day. Right, right. Yeah, not, you know, we all have ideas about what would work best for people, but I can tell you that, you know, the person knows and, um, and, and plenty of times I'm just looking for my clinicians or my ATPs experience and expertise themselves, like, please recommend, but pl uh, also ask me, you know, make sure I'm part of that collaborative process. I have a good idea, especially, you know, after this amount of years, I, I have a better idea. But even in the beginning, um, there's certain things, you know, that, that we want. And if we don't have them, it doesn't give us a, a nice start in, you know, the world of our power chairs, which is hard enough transition to begin with. But if we are feeling uncomfortable or just don't like something about it, I mean, I've heard so many stories from community members and it can really hold them back. I know that even I have been, you know, held back, like I'm uncomfortable in this chair. I, you know, I don't want to deal with this right now. And, you know, it stifled me a bit. Well, I think it's safe to say as the consumer, and the individual using the product, like you know your body best, you know what you need to do every day the best. And so certainly you need to have a strong voice in that process. Um, awesome. So um, I know we're, we're wrapping up on our time so we can kind of shift into some other conversations. But before we do, I'm curious, when it comes to your drive control, we kind of talked about considerations for you, like the aesthetics, like the comfort, like the fact that you have spasticity. And so, you know, maybe a header or something like that doesn't work in your specific scenario. Um, what what things I'm curious what things you do through your drive control typically when you have one that's working well for you um, besides driving. Driving is kind of a given, but is there anything else you tend to do through your drive control? Yeah, um, controlling my seating is is huge. Um, I love having the option of the iDevice um, to set up switches if I need. Um, and my seat elevator is literally my favorite thing about my power chair. I just, I like being able to go up and, you know, it's something that I haven't always had. And so on my newer chair, um, having that has, has been huge, you know, I'm like going to concerts, going to look oh. at vistas that I had never been able to look over the, you know, the barrier wall. So, um, yeah, I love it. Plus just, I can sit mm. at tall tables and it's novel. Um, but uh, yeah, it's nice to be able to do that on my own. And um, yeah, what else do I do with my, my, I think that's mostly what I do. Um, I did have yeah. to get afterwards, get my, my USB put in because that was with the Starburst wheels. Oh, I didn't ask. Well, okay. just ask, you know, yes, yeah. I'd like as much things uh, that make sense to have. And then there's other things, you know, even um, various elbow blocks and knee things that I, you know, some of them I pass on, you know, sometimes I've had chairs that have too many things on them and I'm like, what are all these things? So yeah, making sure we're not being wasteful um, when ordering. Great. Great, is there anything, thank you so much. Is there anything else you wanna share with our audience uh, before we shift gears into the clinical perspective? Uh, you know, just, yeah, being mindful and getting to know the person you're working with. I, I think that's huge. You need to know about their life and, you know, their car and their home life because it really does make a difference uh, um, in terms of the chair they're going to need. So, um, yeah, be mindful and, and, and know that this is part of our, part of our bodies and our, our clothing and it's everything. It's, it's beyond, um, beyond just clothes, but. But yeah, we're wearing it. It's part of our, our new humanity. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your valuable perspective. Um, really, really appreciate it. Of course. Um, so I think what we'll do now is we will transition over to Sarah. And then at the end, if anyone has questions for Brooke, we're going to do a Q&A um, little session towards the end of, of today's webinar. So certainly stay tuned if you want to ask Brooke questions directly. Sarah, over to you. Thanks a lot, Angela, and thanks again, Brooke. I want to thank Brooke again for coming on and really giving us some great insight into her experiences with the wheelchair evaluation process and different alternative drive control devices, and really reminding us the importance of continually recentering and reevaluating our clinical thinking um, and making sure we consider all available options. 
So when it comes to you know, the wheelchair evaluation process, what we know and what Brooks Insight really reinforced is that there are many components and considerations that we have to take into account in order to achieve um, an optimal outcome that's successful, not only because it's technically sound or it's rooted in best practice, uh, but because it's individualized and because it takes into that collaboration that Brooke talked um, so well about. And the alternative drive control assessment itself is really an extension of those same ideas and those same tenants. And it should be designed in a way to ensure that the drive control um, is selected to meet an individual's mobility needs, while at the same time really being a part of a whole wheelchair system that's meant to promote health and maximize independence and integrate with everyday technology and everyday accessibility needs. And a part of this and what makes it important um, on our end is to be able to adapt and adjust our clinical thinking to meet those individualized needs and the goals of every individual that um, we work with. And in order to do this, we have to really have a good understanding of the wide range of factors that may be involved, a lot of which um, Brooke, again, really touched on. For the alternative drive control evaluation, one of those really important factors is obviously the individual's experience with different types of controls or different types of wheelchairs. Um, obviously, they're bringing in a lot of knowledge and a lot of personal experience that they're coming in with. They're bringing a lot of knowledge about the things that they need the wheelchair to be able to do, the alternative drive control um, needs to be able to do. And even if it's their first experience with a wheelchair or their first experience with a drive control, even if it's an entirely new experience, they're going to be bringing in personal knowledge and personal experiences that we can draw upon to help them make a well-informed decision and still allow it for it to be that really collaborative process that's so important. And we also want to be kind of um, considerate of, you know, if it is a drive control that maybe they're making a change from one type of drive control, Brooke talked about, you know, moving between different types of drive controls, the consideration for moving from one type of drive control to another type of drive control. And when we do that, you know, are we looking at increasing independence? Are we making a change because there was a change in functional status? So are we looking to increase independence or are we just looking um, to maintain ability and maintain accessibility. And so what are, um, what are our needs with that? And that may affect the sequence that with which we move through the evaluation or ultimately the type of drive control we wind up with, right? But ultimately it kind of comes back to, again, being considerate of the needs of the drive control within the context of the needs of the system as a whole. How is the drive control going to help us accomplish all the things that the individual needs to be able to do um, in the wheelchair as a whole? Um, Brooke talked about, you know, being able to move in the wheelchair, but also being able to access her power seat functions, access the technology that she needs to um, access her environment. Right. So we need the drive control to be adaptable to all those different factors. So it helps us, again, develop that individualized plan of care, not only for the assessment, uh, for the drive control, but for the whole seating system and the whole wheelchair. And, you know, this is where individualized goals, you know, help us lead to individualized evaluation. And this is where we have some great evidence-based resources for wheelchair provision that we can help use as a framework, right? We have resources from Resna. Clinically, we have things like the ICF model. But we may just need to shift our thinking a little in order to really view the findings within the context of specific considerations for the alternative tribe control assessment. So we're really looking at the same factors, but maybe just viewing them through a slightly different lens in order to take those considerations um, under slightly different advisement. So when we're looking at things like environmental considerations or technological adaptability, how an individual is going to be able to themselves adapt to different technologies, but also how the technologies are going to be able to adapt to their changing needs, things like that. And along those lines, you know, we're able to kind of take the drive control selection and set up and really use it as an extension of the evaluation process. And this allows us to consider the full capabilities of the technology alongside the abilities and needs of the individual. 
So that lets us look at things like movement patterns, range of motion, strength, right? Right alongside things like what type of hardware we're going to use, what are our mounting locations, um, because you know all those things kind of can play together. So you know if we look at someone that's using you know fine motor control versus gross motor control, you know how much range of motion are they able to utilize those movement patterns within? That lets us set up okay, well we know we are working within you know certain locations for them being able to mount that drive control in order to give them the most consistent uh, consistency of access or the most stability for access and then you know there are additional factors that come into play where does that access change based off of you know how much fatigue they have or if their endurance changes throughout the day or if we're anticipating those endurance needs um, to change you know over a period of time of weeks or months um, those all come into play about the type of drive control we may be looking at. And there's obviously some overarching things like the cognitive demands of the types of different drive controls, and then things like visual perceptual abilities of the individual, as well as things like sensory integration or things like proprioception that kind of interplay between these different factors as well. And as we move on from some of those evaluation factors, it lets us look into the recommendation for different types of drive controls. And this diagram kind of represents a simplified but key point, which is that as stability, control, range of motion, and endurance, as those things that we may have found in the evaluation start to decrease, oftentimes we see the technology needs start to increase. And it's this inverse relationship that really reflects the basic foundation for alternative drive control evaluation, um, selection, and trial. So, you know, when the standard drive control is no longer to meet an individual's needs, we can start to then kind of move up the hierarchy of drive controls and start to consider what other types of drive controls are able to then meet their needs the best. And on this hierarchy of drive controls, in general, we see that proportional controls are often considered before switch controls. Um, this is due to a couple different factors. Um, the main one being that with proportional controls, um, because of the way they're configured, they allow for you know, more infinite control of speed and direction. And this can result in more fluid responses of the chair and the drive control. Um, when we evaluate for proportional controls though, they themselves have their own clinical considerations, right? So we want to make sure that the individual's you know, motor control and their access is consistent and it's reproducible because if they aren't able to sustain that graded movement or you know, that graded movement you know, degrades with fatigue, then they're not really able to take advantage of the proportionality of the drive control. So, you know, if all those factors aren't kind of working together, then are they really, you know, taking advantage of all the things that a proportional drive control can give them? And it's important to note when we look at proportional controls too, some of the um, factors that go into a proportional control, um, things like how much force it takes to deflect the joystick um, or how far the joystick needs to be deflected to activate, some of those are inherent to the joystick itself, but some of those can be affected by posture, by mounting, or even by programming. Um, so it's important to take all that into the consideration of the setup and the evaluation as well. And then kind of from there, so moving up from proportional controls, if someone's physically unable to utilize a proportional uh, control or if a proportional control isn't able to meet their goals or their personal preferences, we can start looking at non-proportional controls. And these are things like head array, sip and puff, switch arrays, and then if we move even kind of further up the hierarchy, we get into um, single switch scanning options, which can be considered. And these drive controls don't require the type of graded movement that proportional controls require because they use input commands that are either on or off to produce direction or function. These controls typically have a high degree of adaptability and configurability because we can use all different types of switches, we can use all different types of mounting locations. Um, typically, individuals don't need a lot of range of motion, right? They don't need a lot of strength. They need little to no strength oftentimes to access these different types of switches. 
So they, again, can really um, meet the needs of individuals who need high degrees of configuration and adaptability. There can be a higher cognitive demand requirement for these types of non-proportional controls um, because of sometimes the sequencing that they require um, with things like the need to um, toggle to achieve um, multiple different directions. But on the other end of that, some individuals may find them easier because of that direct on-off command relationship. So again, it just goes back to um, talking through all the options with the individual, what their needs are, um, how they've been doing with other types of um, maybe interventions, um, what other factors there are, um, such as you know proprioceptive, sensory, those other things are gonna come into consideration when you talk about non-proportional controls as well. And the drive control, um, as we know, is just one component of the wheelchair system. And it has the ability to both be influenced by and the ability to influence other wheelchair factors. We can't talk about drive control setup without talking about positioning. Um, for the clinicians on the call, right, I'm sure you've heard it a lot, proximal stability is a key component uh, for providing distal mobility. And especially um, in talking about drive controls for providing access to drive controls. But there's also that important balance between positioning and function. And sometimes we need to um, make compromises between positioning and function. We may need to make allowances for how much uh, positioning we do or don't provide in order to give someone access to um, functional access to a drive control. So again, all comes back to just talking about what are the goals of the system um, as a whole, and then what are the individual needs of that user. Base selection and drive configuration is another key factor. We know that not everyone will benefit from the same drive wheel configuration, but it's also important to consider that not every drive wheel configuration can be treated the same uh, depending on the type of drive control that you're using. So um, based off of the type of programming that you're doing, the performance characteristics that are in the base and in the integrated technology of the chair, such as tracking technology, um, the base's uh, environmental negotiation abilities, um, torque generation, power generation, its maneuverability characteristics, those are all gonna have an interplay um, depending on the type of drive control that you're using. And then, you know, going to power seat functions, we know that obviously power seat functions have a relationship with the drive control. So sometimes power seat functions can increase someone's access to their drive control, but we also wanna make sure that we're setting up the drive control, we're setting up switch access, so that in all positions, someone has the ability to access their power seat functions. So the effective positioning, uh, the effective gravity, the effective fatigue, the effective things like spasticity, someone has access to all their wheelchair functions, all their power seat functions um, in any position that they may um, find themselves in or need to be positioned in. Thank you. Um, I think something sometimes we overlook is the importance of programming. You know, we spend a lot of time, especially in delivery and in setup, focusing on alignment, on positioning, on the physical setup of the device. Um, but programming, programming is really an essential component of drive control setup um, and can really optimize control of the wheelchair functions not just to enhance mobility, um, but really um, enhance uh, the other wheelchair functions as well. And for programming, we see that similar relationship that we saw with drive control selection, which is that as strength and range of motion and stability decrease, often the programming uh, needs increase. And then the last thing just quickly to touch on is that, you know, we don't want to overlook technology integration as well. Um, we heard Brooke talk about this as well, but with wireless technology integration, we see both increasing options as well as increasing need, both uh, a personal increasing need as well as an increasing societal demand for technology integration. And how and why we choose different methods of integration come down to a lot of different factors. Um, so it's just important to keep in mind that there's both internal factors that are internal to the wheelchair itself, but a lot of external options as well. So the external options that are on the device that the individual is going to be using, but there are external options as well if the onboard options that the wheelchair has may not meet everyone's needs. So if you have an individual and they need ex uh, additional technology integration options, don't be afraid to look outside the wheelchair as well for additional external options. 
And also just, you know, keep in mind that depending on the type of um, drive control that you're using, that's going to have an impact on how someone um, may be able to efficiently access their technology. So there's going to be differences in proportional and non-proportional controls. So that's kind of a quick overview of, of some of the key clinical considerations um, and, you know, looking back at how those integrate with um, the client perspectives and the user perspectives. So um, I hope this was, this was kind of a, a useful overview um, for all of you. We couldn't get into to everything about it, but, but I hope it was a, a good, useful overview. And um, I can hand it off to Angela now to go over some of the, the permobile options that we have um, that you can utilize some of this information for. Um, so as we kind of transition into the last section of this webinar, which is to review our new head array solutions from Permobile. Um, I think just thinking about what Brooke and Sarah had to provide today and, and tell us, you know, it's it's good to start thinking about how the consumer's goals and needs um, that Brooke so eloquently shared can be combined with the clinical considerations shared by Sarah, really in order to determine what op options um, would be good to, to evaluate and, and trial during that process. Um, we know, you know, from, from both of their perspectives, from your experience probably um, out in the field that, you know, it's very clear that finding the right match based on the consumer's goals and abilities is really key to that successful outcome. And so um, as I shift gears into head arrays, what I would love for you all to think about is as we go through these different options, you know, think about what Brooke had to say, think about what Sarah had to say, and what are some specific scenarios or considerations you could you could apply their um, thoughts and feedback on um, when we start to think about these specific solutions that we're talking about next. So we'll start with the total control head array from Permobile. And the total control head array is a product that Permobile has had for some time. And the new updates really take this product's adjustability and versatility to like a whole nother level. So We've maintained the electronic features that the total control head array is known for, such as the compatibility with both proximity sensors and mechanical switches. So you can use either or or both, depending on the client's need. Um, the plug and play configuration to address a variety of control needs, it makes it really easy um, to change different switch directions um, if needed. And then the ability to mount the switches basically anywhere. So perhaps you need to switch at the head and one at the knee or one at the foot. Um, it really gives you that flexibility, flexibility quite easily. Um, so we've we've maintained all of that and then we've improved upon the hardware and the occipital pad comfort while maintaining that minimal design. So that really allows the user to control their chair without being um, kind of overwhelmed by the equipment, if you will. For our US based folks on the call, the total control head array continues to have the E23 um, the E2330 code, which is the non-proportional head control interface. So let's take a look, a closer look at the new updates. First up is the BodyLink Max 8 mounting hardware, which we see here. This hardware offers superior strength and adjustability for reliable positioning. And something that we probably all know if we either use a head array or we've used one with a client before, that positioning really is critical when it comes to a head array. Um, it can be very frustrating when the drive control unintentionally comes out of adjustment, um, which can make it harder to be successful in driving and whatever other tasks the person is using the head array for. So that strength is super critical. Um, the piano hinge style joints with the double taper design result in that maximum maximum strength, while the lateral rotation and option for an additional four inch link result in a wide uh, range of header positioning options. So you can get that header pretty much wherever you would need it for successful driving. We also have the body link flip down mounting hardware as an option for scenarios where that head array needs to be fully cleared from around the individual's head. So if swinging the side sensors out of the way is not enough, say for a Hoyer lift transfer, or kind of back to Brooks examples, like if aesthetics is really critical for the person and maybe they're on a conference call and they don't want anything around their head, those scenarios where it's important to just get the whole thing away from them, we have this optional flip down hardware um, that swings back the entire head array 120 degrees away from the person's head and then it can be easily put back um, when it's time to drive. So that's the BodyLink Max 8 hardware. 
The second update is the Permobil Swing Away Lateral Arm Hardware. So it has 25% greater strength than the previous lateral arm hardware and outward facing screw heads um, for quick adjustments, which we see here on the sides of those. Um, let me get my pointer here. I like to talk with my hands. Here's where you adjust adjust the screw heads um, to, to change the location of the arm. So it makes it really quick and easy to make adjustments. Um, and really with those things, that side sensor positioning has never really been easier. Um, another thing that the um, new swing away hardware features is a quick release um, latch that requires less than one pound of force to activate. So we see that in action here. It's um, nice and easy for the caregiver to really release and get out of the way for, for whatever reason is needed. The third update is the new occipital pad cover. The um, existing occipital pad and the new cover measuring four inches by six inches improves user comfort and reduces friction. Um, this is something that we really wanted to be sure to address with these updates based on the feedback from the field from you all. Um, the cover is also another added layer of protection to prevent any moisture from reaching the sensors and resulting in unintended activation, for example, due to rain or wet hair. The cover is also easily removable for cleaning, which is certainly comes in handy um, in keeping that equipment in good working order. So what we're gonna do next is watch a quick video that highlights everything that we just reviewed. So let me go ahead and launch that video. Just briefly in summary on the total control header rate updates, we have the new BodyLink Max 8 hardware, we have 25% stronger lateral sensor arm swing away hardware, and that new occipital pad cover for improved comfort and reduced friction. And all of this combined with the option for proximity sensors or mechanical switches, along with the ability to mount those switches virtually anywhere, um, really make the total control header array one of the most versatile switched header arrays on the market and all in that compact streamlined design. So we're gonna move on next to the ASL Fusion Proportional and Digital Header A, which is now available on Permobile M and F Series Corpus and Corpus VS order forms. So if proportionality is key, Sarah kind of covered proportional versus non-proportional and, and some of the considerations for that. If proportionality is really one of the goals um, that's come out through the evaluation and, and what we think will work functionally best for the user, the ASL Fusion proportional and digital header array is a nice option. Because the Fusion is customizable through programming, it can be it can really accommodate a wide range of diagnoses and is ideal for individuals with changing needs. You can program the Fusion as proportional, digital, or a combination of the two to best meet the client's drive control preferences and needs. For our US audience on the call, the Fusion is coded as an E2328 proportional head control. So in addition to being new to Permobile, the ASL Fusion also features recently updated occipital and lateral pads for improved user comfort. And we'll also talk a little bit about the hardware on the Fusion. The ball joints of the ASL multi-axis hardware provide simple and secure positioning. And the lateral arm can be adjusted in length and positioning with just one screw. Um, which we see here. And then the side sensor spot pad features a unique ball joint that is adjustable with just several turns of a wrench. So both of those things make it pretty quick and easy to adjust based on the client's positioning, um, positioning needs. All right, so when it comes to the Fusion, the ASL Fusion, there are really two main components, the Fusion head array, and then the Fusion Display Programmer and Attendant Control, which we see here on the left. The ASL Fusion Display Programmer and Attendant Control does several things. Um, we will start with the programming piece of it 
today, um, that programming piece allows for customization of the Fusion. There are many things that can be programmed, and while a full overview of the programming of the, the Fusion is outside the scope of today's webinar, I'd like to highlight just a few things that I think can make a big functional difference for the consumer. Um, programming the Fusion as proportional, digital, or a combination of the two, which we mentioned earlier, can be done under the pad settings. Um, and you can kind of see here how it works. So um, the, when you see, let's see here, let me get my little pointer again. Um, so for example, right now this head array is set up as proportional for the left and back head pad and then digital or switched for the right head pad. So you can change that based on just tapping it. And then if it is set to proportional, you have the ability to change the minimum and maximum um, force requirements. So the client can push into the pad, you can see how much force they can provide, and you can set that range so that they can be successful within the range of motion and strength that they have. So that's nice how you can really adjust it initially. And then if it needs to change over time, whether it's a progressive diagnosis or they're just changing in function, um, it can certainly be changed as they change. You can also turn off any functions that aren't being used, and that's what this column over here is for. So um, if the person isn't using all of these different things, you can turn them off so that ultimately there's less options over here in the menu, and that just helps them be more efficient, have less clicks, um, so that they really only have on the display what they're using. So for example, if a client doesn't need to put the chair to sleep, or they don't use Bluetooth through the Fusion, um, you know, this isn't the Bluetooth through the chair. This would be like if they were using the Fusion with a tech lab, for example. If they're not doing that, you can turn that off so that they don't have to go through so many clicks. Um, another nice thing, you can do some um, head array diagnostics through the programmer as well. If there's something that's not working, that can help to kind of problem solve what may be going on. Um, with the display and programmer and attendant control, you can see here that there's an RNET icon in the upper left-hand corner over here. Um, and that is because there is an RNET enable feature with the Fusion so that the system is ready to use with Permobile, um, which we will go through here in a minute. But it's important to note that any Fusion ordered from Permobile um, will come with that RNET feature already enabled because we assume that you're using it um, with our chair. So again, these are just a few highlights of the programming that I chose to touch on today, given the functional implications. If you're excited to learn more about the Fusion, please don't hesitate to reach out to your local Permobile um, rep. Um, ASL also has some really great resources um, when it comes to the programming functionality and, and how to do so. So there's certainly resources out there if you are ready to learn more. Um, okay, so we'll also move on to the, dis the um, display programmer and tenant control is obviously also a display as the name alludes to. So um, that allows for clean integration with the RNET electronics. So through that ASL display, the consumer can navigate into seating, which deactivates the back head pad for smooth operation of powered seating functions. Um, sometimes with proportional head arrays, it can be tricky to do your seating because in some other models that back head pad doesn't deactivate and then the consumer has to lift their head off to get out of their tilt, which um, often isn't feasible or comfortable or advised. And so by using the display um, along with the Fusion and the, um, the Arnet Electronics, we can make sure that head pad is deactivated and they can successfully do their pressure reliefs and, and whatever they need to do um, from the different positions, including tilt. So another thing that's nice, um, it allows the individual to power off the head array independently. So you'll see um, power on off on this little user menu here. That allows the client to turn the head array on or off by themselves without the need for an extra switch or someone turning off the chair for them. That could come in handy if they are you know, needing to move around for a functional reason or move around for a social reason, talking, looking at people, um, and they're not driving and they don't wanna accidentally activate their head array. They can independently turn it off. When they're ready to go again, they can independently turn it on all through that one user switch versus having to have a second switch that's plugged into the power of the Omni 2. So that's also really a handy piece um, that they can do through that display. 
Um, programming and attendant assist functionality is also really easy now because there is a new quick release magnetic mounting hardware. So we see it here, um, but we also can kind of see how it's mounted to the Omni arm here. And so when you order this on chair, um, if you order the display and programmer, that mounting hardware is going to come with it so that it's nice and easy to, for the client to view the display, but also to take it off, whether you're programming or um, they're choosing to use the attendant assist functionality. So let's talk about that piece um, and then we'll wrap it up here. So the um, Fusion Display Programmer and Attendant Control also has attendant drive functionality, which allows the attendant or caregiver to assist the client with driving. Um, and basically how that works is they hit a little icon in the bottom right-hand corner of the display. You can see it here. Um, and that brings up this screen here and allows them to use their finger to drive and it can be set to proportional or digital. So if it's set to proportional, as, as the finger goes away from that neutral circle, the chair is going to go faster. The cool thing about this is you don't have to get out of the Omni 2. So if it's a quick adjust, you don't have to take control with an attendant joystick, make the change, then give the person back control so they can use their, their head array. You can go in through the user menu real quick, make the adjust, and then the Omni 2 is still active for that individual to use. It can also be active as an attendant while the header is also active. So depending on the scenario, if folks are working together to navigate a tight space, you can do that. Um, so we're gonna watch a quick video and then we will wrap it up here. So I hope everyone enjoyed learning a little bit more about the new solutions that we're offering at Promobile from a header standpoint. Um, and, and obviously, most importantly, hearing from Brooke and certainly Sarah um, on their perspectives as well. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time for questions, but I'm happy to answer any, or Brooke and Sarah, we're all happy to answer any if there are any we can answer. Okay, thank you very much, Angela, Sarah, and Brooke. Um, we do have some questions. Uh, so one question that came in is, when are these products available? Are they are they available now or do we have to wait? That is a great question. They are available now. They're on our order forms. Um, they've been available since May 16th. So um, yeah, immediately okay. available. Yep. Yay, that's good to know. Okay, there's there's a question here for Brooke. Brooke, I'm, I, I hope you're still with us. Um, this, this came in, they asked, um, have you trialed or do you know anything about the new uh, Tech Vigo headset? Um, I don't know if I'm getting that one right or not. I, I actually have not heard of that uh, at all. I'm okay. Curious. Okay. That came in from um, a person named Lance Porter. So um, the other question is. Um, Really, it was another uh, real, I don't know, this is a, probably not a quick question, but uh, it's for Brooke. Um, the question was, what, what's your experience with communicating your alternative drive control needs, uh, if, for example, with positioning when you're working with new caregivers? Uh, like, do you have strategy on uh, talking to them or trying to help them set, set you up for success or? Interesting question. Um... I have had, so I've had my main caregivers for a long time, uh, so I haven't had to do tons of that. Um, 
I mean, I like to do my my controls as independently as possible. It's not, you know, that, that's not always the case, but I do. I want to spasm. Um, but I do show them so they're they're familiar, so they know that they can go in. Um, the chair I have currently has a, a attendant drive in the back that they can do that with, or show them how to do it through my chair, so they always know. Both sides, they need to be pretty familiar, you know, in case there's an emergency or something where I can't do that on my own. Um, so I, just being as transparent as possible with people and showing them and making sure they're um, able to help me as they need. Thanks, everyone. If we didn't get to your question, we will certainly email you. We'll be in touch. Take care. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Brooke. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay.